cyst will have a powerful memory of that patient that comes in with an open pharmacy bag or a packet of tablets in their hand and says, my wife got this last week and I don't think it's the right thing. And your heart just sinks. I am not going to share any of those patient stories. I'm going to share another patient story because we may come on to that type of uh, interaction later in our discussion and the drug and patient story that I want to share with you is uh, nifedipine and this particular patient was pregnant and was attending a 24-week checkup in her antenatal care and at that 24-week checkup it was discovered that her blood pressure was extremely elevated and she had proteins in the urine, the consultant was called in and basically that patient was admitted to hospital that day. The patient was then started on lobetalol and lobetalol just didn't cut it and then was introduced to nifedipine and nifedipine managed to reduce the patient's blood pressure, it managed to eliminate the proteins in the urine, it allowed the patient to get to 28 weeks. However, at that 28 week stage, the patient's kidneys were starting to fail and therefore the patient had to have an emergency section. But the, the positive story about this is because of that nifedipine in stabilising the blood pressure and getting that patient to 28 weeks, that premature two pound baby, I'm, I'm happy to say, is now a very healthy, long haired, heavy metal loving, 20 year old student that I'm proud to call my son. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, a lovely story. Absolutely. Well, I was going to say, because nifedipine, you know, it's very hard to get actually these days. There's very few people on it. So yeah. that's a that's a lovely, powerful memory. That's the emotion we were after, Jill. We it was, yeah. absolutely. And, it, you know, a lot of people did benefit from it, but yeah. I've got a really shallow reason for liking nifedipine. It was a really cool looking box. Um, <laughs> it, was, um, it was a white box with like a Starsian Hutch red stripe through it. Sorry, Jill. Oh, no, it's all right. You're going to have to go some now to beat that. So what about your <laughs> what about your soundtrack then? What about your soundtrack for the Oral Apothecary Spotify playlist? I just have to say, dearie, dearie me. I was listening to last week's episode, Tessa Lewis, the Welsh GP, and I was walking to the dentist to get a filling when I was listening to it. And I heard her saying that her career anthem was back cello suite number one and I'm thinking oh wow wow that's very different very different and then I heard her saying that she actually plays it on her <laughs> own cello and I'm thinking yeah. oh my god wow wow so so we've got big expectations Jill class and culture that is uh Jill. well exactly one of you actually and I've quote we always knew our guests would bring class to this show and I was just thinking oh no it, I'm going to buck the trend come on give it to us okay the the track I would like to um, share is Vogue by Madonna. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I love that. If my daughter was here now, she'd be doing it with me. The, the... For the listeners, Steve is voguing. He is voguing, yes. So, and I just like to say the reason that I have chosen this is not so much for the, the track itself, but more for the amazing music video that went along with it. And dance has always been a big part of my life. I started dancing when I was six and I actually wanted to be a dancer, but I really didn't have the necessary talent. So I chose to do pharmacy instead. And when I moved to Edinburgh in the early 90s to start my pharmacy career, I got involved in dance um, and choreography with a number of companies and choreographed shows in the Edinburgh Fringe. The Madonna video of Vogue really influenced my choreography. If you've ever watched it, it is all about simple moves delivered in a way with style and confidence. Yes, just like you, Steve, as I watch you on Zoom right now. Um, and I took that I took that kind of philosophy of, you know, when I was working with groups of people and choreographing a number of taking just simple moves and layering them and building up into creating a story. And there's a line in the track that says, there's a place you can get away. It's called the dance floor and here's what it's for. And it goes into that iconic armography, which you so beautifully displayed there, Steve. Oh, and... you want to see it when I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> You know, still to this day, not that you really do hear it that often, but when you hear those first chords and then the syncopated finger clicking, you know, I have this need to kind of get up, strut and start just kind of waving my arms about. So Madonna Vogue is my anthem. I don't know why you thought you might be embarrassed. That is an absolute stunner as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> the failed dancer is a, is a different narrative to the failed medic for pharmacy as well, isn't it? So that's, <laughs> yes, um, that's, yeah. that's great as well. <laughs> OK, well, we'll definitely put that in the oral apothecary spot 
Spotify playlist. We love that. And the third thing then, and as you know, the listeners are really keen on this and lots of people saying how they've enjoyed the book choices. So what would you give us for the Oral Apothecary Library? Okay, this was the most difficult choice because when I got the email to ask to come on this podcast, I picked out five books from my bookshelf and I've had them sitting on my desk and just swithering which one to share. But I've decided on it. And the book that I'd like to share is a book that I have recommended probably the most. And that book has then gone on to be recommended by those I recommend it to. And there's a nice tie-in with this podcast because the book was recommended to me by Jamie. Ah. And Jamie, I wonder if you can remember oh, which book that gonna, it you, was. You're going to out one of my favourite secret books now. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because it was recommended to me by a school friend and colleague. Yeah, so the book that I would like to recommend for the Oral Apocryphy Library is The Crossroads of Should and Must by Ellie Luna. And this book, first of all, it is beautiful to touch. It's beautifully illustrated and you could probably read it in an hour. And it's what I would call like a coffee table book or a bedside table book. And you should read it once a year. It is a story are that we all have two paths in life, the path of must and the path of should. And at various points in life, you come to a crossroads when really you have a choice to make and you stick with the things that you should do or do you go on and follow your heart? And the the author herself goes on, it describes how she went from, you know, a really successful app um, designer to actually following her must, which was to become an artist. But you know, I've read the book four times now. I read it again just before this podcast, and every time I've read it, there's always been something that has made me stop, think, and actually change something in my life. Mm, I really look forward to that. That sounds great. The Crossroads of Should and Must. It is a really powerful book. And so for the listeners out there that are going to run out and order it and read it, because that's the effect we have on the podcast, Jill, it comes with a warning. It is deep and people will be in tears reading it and it will really make them question the direction in which their life and their in their careers in particular as well are going. We didn't get a chance to ask you. I know Steve's going to give me daggers for going off topic, but you're writing a book as well, Jill? Yeah, I am writing a book and it's called The five senses philosophy it's a way of thinking and communicating that will help you feel more confident and in control it basically came about as a result of i did three research projects under the banner of the pharmacy profession competence to confidence after the first research project there was a message that came out within it that as a profession we focus a lot on our professional development and also our clinical development but we perhaps don't focus so much on our emotional development and that's anything to do with increasing the flexibility of how you think and how you communicate and I kind of coined the phrase emotional development is quality improvement of the mind and with that um, I published a series of articles actually via Jonathan Laird's website Pharmacy in Practice and then the RPS got wind of that and asked if I would design a programme for early years pharmacists I came up with this programme um, based on my research work and also the work I was doing with clients it's basically looked at the five senses of sense of purpose, sense of balance, sense of value, sense of optimism and sense of awareness. And they assessed themselves against that. I introduced a simple coaching model and shared some emotional development techniques with them. The main messages that came out from those that attended the programme were that they felt more confident and in control. During covid I had a thought, you know, I want to do this book. I want to write this book. So change the name to appeal to a wider audience rather than the five senses of pharmacy to the five senses philosophy. And I'm currently working on it just now. Perfect. We'll be joined by a digital assistant then on that little bit of the call. I'm not sure. Somebody. Yeah, I think somebody's phone might have gone off. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Right on to our micro discussion next. And as I mentioned in the intro, we've chosen an article from the British Journal of Pharmacology, not yet in print, but online and available in our speaker notes. The article looks at the nature uh, severity and cause of medication incidents in an Australian community pharmacy. And as we've discussed on the podcast several times, really, because these are some of the themes and threads running through the podcast around medicine safety and, and shared decision making. A lot of the medicine safety initiatives we've discussed have been based in secondary care. And with Jill on the pod, we decided we'd look at this piece of work. And with our growing Australian audience, then we would uh, we would throw this into the mix. So, Jill, did you have a chance to have a browse? Yes, I did. What really stood out for me was the fact that they talked about the, um, the Swiss cheese model um, in terms of, uh, I think it's a model that's used in the aviation industry that uh, helps create a common understanding of how harmful events occur and how they can be prevented 
did. You know, it took me back to uh, probably about three years ago when we were doing a session um, around quality improvement and safety with pharmacists in the good old days when you could have face-to-face um, training. It was a really powerful session using that Swiss cheese model. And what we chose to do was actually use live cheese and knitting needles <laughs> to demonstrate every slice of cheese was an element of the process and dispensing. And we proved that when all were there, the knitting needle couldn't get through the cheese. But when you took away one of the slices of cheese, the knitting needle could go through. There was bits of hazards around the the, the cheese melting and and becoming very limp during um, a very hot training room. However, one of the things that came through in that training session was where in the dispensing process, one of the areas that causes the most amount of errors or near misses or good catches, as I like to call them, is when a dispenser dispenses from labels and not actually the prescription. That's the biggest impact on errors or near misses, good catches in community pharmacy settings. So I like the fact that they approached or, or took the approach of um, the Swiss cheese model within the study. All I can think about is that with a knitting needle, you could still force it through even if it wasn't a hole. But that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other t- chat about the merits of the Swiss cheese model. Good shout this, Jamie. And, and one of the things I noticed was it, it sort of said that the majority of the her- errors happen up the line, i.e. at the prescribing stage. What it, it got me thinking, what is it community pharmacists can do about that? Because we've chatted in the past about how often the community pharmacist's role is to ring the GP up and tell them that they've made a mistake and that doesn't make for the best relationships. And so... It doesn't really describe it much in the paper, but I guess it made me think about how are community pharmacists involved in feeding back and supporting safer prescribers, you know, from the general practice. Pharmacists focus much more on the dispensing errors and getting that part right. But actually, this paper saying it's the prescribing. Jamie, I think um, it, it also comes down to the environment I used to work in. Um, I worked very closely with the GP surgery, and I would have no issue at all in phoning up the GP and discussing sort of prescribing errors, and it, it was welcomed. And you know, there's one particular GP. You know, if I came on the phone, she went, "Oh my God, what have I done now?" <laughs> um, and we used to have a bit of a joke and a, and a laugh about it. And I think you know, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about you know, it's about relationships. And if you've got that relationship there, it's an easy two-way communication because we each understand each other's environments and we each have respect for each other's roles. I'm going to take a very different take on this paper and medication safety is my thing. And it just left me a little bit... empty uh, i mean this is data from 2010 to 2011 so 10 years ago and i'm sure culturally they've moved on a lot since then but there's nothing new in this uh darren ashcroft who i work with at university of manchester was doing this in 2005 in community pharmacies just looking at dispensing errors and i think you know, that one of the reasons why prescribing errors comes up is that potentially of course if you ask people to report even though some of the methodology was quite clever and that it was anonymous or confidential, which is great, that you are always going to look at other people's mistakes rather than perhaps report yourself. And I suppose the disappointing thing is, and I know it's a voluntary reporting system, but it happened over 30 months with 30 pharmacies. Do you know how many were reported on average per day? One. And I think that just tells you everything you need to know about how good we are at reporting when things go wrong. And if you look at the NRLS data in England... So I looked at last year's data and it's pitiful what gets reported in community, both general practice and community pharmacy. And the one thing I do like about this paper is his conclusion is the medication safety agenda is broadly hospital centric. Which, remind me, was the subject of your dissertation at your MPhil thing, wasn't it? Yeah. So I looked into the attitudes of hospital pharmacists to reporting medication safety errors, yeah. So I do, I do know a bit about this literature, yeah. And so the Manchester literature is heavily referenced throughout, as is next week's guest, actually, is heavily referenced in the, uh, in the paper as well. We'll come on to that in a moment. The bit I picked up on fits in with what you say, uh, Steve, in that the original work on psychological safety was done by Professor Amy Edmondson, Harvard professor, and it was done in the environment of hospital wards. And if I, if I was going to try it on like some of our guests have done on the pod over the last uh, three months, and I was going to ask for more than one book to go in the library. <laughs> my second book to go in the library, even though Jill has just mentioned one of my favourite books as well, would be Amy Edmondson's The Fearless Organisation. And it describes her journey as she realised that the reporting at ward level in this case, and this is where community pharmacy may be on this journey, that some of the, the superintendents of the big chains will, will have different date on this, I know. But she describes that at that ward level, the culture of being able to report 
And if you didn't have that psychological safety, and we talk about it a lot in all areas now, then people don't feel safe to report. Things don't don't get reported in that way. And so the fearless organisation creating psychological safety in the workplace is an absolutely superb read. And it fits right in with perhaps what we've seen through the data that's come out of this piece. And I think we'll definitely pick up on psychological safety again. But the, I, I think this was the line I liked in the...